So we're going to talk about discovery because from discovery we're going to go right into these forms that <coughs> are boring. Uh, that we have DNA discovery, SANE discovery, data discovery, serology discovery, crime scene discovery. Uh, you can read the rest. Those, that's all the discovery that I usually ask for with the exception of the, the uh, disciplines that I'm not qualified in, which would be the computer stuff and the data stuff. Bless you. Um, so we're going to break down a typical DNA discovery packet. I'm assuming that many of you, if you have experts, if you don't have experts, when you get your discovery in and it's a DNA case or a, or a forensics case, you get a whole bunch of discovery, right? Maybe? Okay, you get a whole bunch of discovery with a whole bunch of forms that really are meaningless to you. So today we're going to try to make them less meaningless. And what I did is I chose a case of mine that has been resolved, but it takes us through pretty much every form that you're going to get in discovery. This was a, a, a burglary case out of Arizona. Um, and so this is the, this is the first page of, of the discovery that I get. I, obviously, I have three samples. Uh, one's a bloody Band-Aid. The other two, it says checked right, under, right here. This is the only one that they do. Of the three samples, the top one is only filled out. And then they have the two other samples right here. And it's checked RNA. And what that means, it's received, but it's not analyzed. So when you see RNA, it's not DNA's count, you know, single. Uh, it's, it, it's as opposed to the double helix, it, it's not the single strand. It's actually just received, but not analyzed. So I look at what, what item actually was analyzed. And yes, that follows suit with the bloody Band-Aid. Then we look at the extraction log. What do we see on the extraction log that is really anything that we want to look at? Um, well, we find our sample right away because in this case, they're batching a whole bunch of samples. So we find our case, and then we look at the reagents. We look at the volume that they're using. We look at the analyst. What you're finding now is you're finding that the analyst that signs the report is not the analyst that is carrying out a lot of this testing. So Melendez-Diaz, Bull Cummings, your confrontation laws, right, that you get the analyst that did this case, you get everybody that worked on this case. And sometimes the technicians that are actually doing the DNA is not the analyst that is signing the report. And you'll get a lot of information out of the technicians because they're not the ones used to testifying. So you call them too, if need be. Let's go to this. If I can't see it, I'm, I apologize. I doubt you guys can. Um, so I'll just read it from my computer and so, start, stop walking around. Um, this is a batch worksheet. Again, we're looking at the analyst, the date, any comments. That is the sample that is our sample in this case. And again, we're looking at what kind of buffers are used, how much buffer, the expiration of the buffers. Those are all very important because you'd be surprised that maybe it's 2015 and they'll go ahead and write down that they, they I mean, they're not thinking sometimes. And I've had buffers that were expired two years ago. And they write it down. That's not acceptable. Um, or it shouldn't be acceptable. This is the quantifiler worksheet. So one thing that I did not mention, yes. We have very, very strict protocols. I, I apologize. I apologize. I'm usually much better at that, Jeff. Uh, the, the question was, what is essentially explain why it is a problem with the buffers and the expiration date. Am I correct with the question? So the problem with that is it would just be like a DUI case and the blood tube being expired, right? So the buffers, the TE buffers, any, any buffer extraction mix, anything that we utilize in the amplification, the extraction, 
um, and, and the, the run of the DNA, if it is expired, a lot of the buffers will not perform and you'll end up getting additional preferential amplification. You'll end up getting results that are not what they should be. You might even get contamination because that buffer has been repeatedly used by other analysts in the lab. So it's very important to look at the expiration date and how old that buffer is. Does that help? Yes. Okay. Um, so this is the, quantita the quantifier worksheet. One thing that I did not mention when we had this slide and I was taking you through um, the DNA extraction with the bloody converse, I, I, I left out a step and that step is the quantify, to, to quantitate the sample, to find out how much DNA we have in that sample to go on, to see if it's enough for us to even attempt obtaining a DNA profile. So what we do is we quantitate it. Now the quant at this, at this level, before even getting the genetic analyzer and amplifying, at this level we can tell if there's male DNA in the sample. So we, we do the, the quantitation. I, again, I look for the analyst who's, who's actually doing this work, the analyst or the, or the technician, whoever. Uh, I look for the dates, expiration. I look for our samples. I look for how much DNA do we have before we add anything to it. So this top one, for instance, is, well, let me just, one that I can read, 2.26 nanograms per microliter. That's a lot. It's not a lot as, as a lot of samples, but that's, we, we're only shooting for 0.5 nanograms per microliter for our amplification process. So then what we look at is, do we have, when we put all the samples together after a quantitation, is the quant curve good? And the quant curve is actually a straight line. If you ever get in a uh, discovery packet one of these that kind of looks like a C or a moon, there's a problem. You're shooting for a straight line. They'll do this until they actually get a straight line usually so you don't have it in your discovery packet. Uh, the sample dilution worksheet, if they have too much DNA, they need to dilute the DNA to get to the target area. So oftentimes you'll see a sample dilution worksheet. Again, you want to look at the batch, the analyst, the date, the number of microliters per microgram, how much the sample per microliter. So the top one there has 25 microliters in the little tube. And then we need to get all of those to 100 microliters. So the last column will show how much TE buffer needs to be added to obtain the 100 microliters. It's the kind of math I don't even need to take my shoes off for. Yes, ma'am. Buffer is, buffer is anything from water, deionized water, to chemicals mixed together to make a, a, a pH balanced buffer for us to bring solutions up to a quantity that we need them. And the question was, what is buffer? So the explanation was, was that. Okay. The next one, again, and these are all sheets that you're going to get that you should get in a proper DNA discovery packet. This is the amplification worksheet. So this worksheet is done when you're ready to amplify. And on this worksheet, again, we look at the analyst, the dates, uh, and now if you want to start sticking sharp objects in your eyes because this gets very redundant, analyst dates, buffers, expiration, uh, your sample, volumes, and, and then you start seeing, after the amplification, you start seeing a comment section. And these comment sections can, can be very, can, can spawn some very, very good information. A lot of times the comment sections will talk about if they're going to run the analyzer at, uh, uh, or, or the amplification at, the, at 24 seconds, or, or uh, not 24 seconds, how many, how many uh, amplification times they're going to do, on the genetic analyzer, how many seconds are they going to run a sample? Because 
We manipulate these machines. We manipulate them to get the best looking electropharograms as we can. So when you get the discovery and you see the electropharograms, when the court sees the electropharograms, we have manipulated that by either running it for 12 seconds, running it for 24 seconds. We do that to get the best looking electropharograms to put into the report and ultimately in discovery and in court. So don't let anybody say that the equipment, the machinery cannot be manipulated. It can, it happens all the time. Yes, sir. Shouldn't that all be standardized? Shouldn't that all be standardized is the question. Otherwise, if somebody can manipulate it, well, you know what manipulation means, it means you get a phony result. Maybe phony, we have deviation logs, but the question, shouldn't it be standardized? I'd still have brown hair if I didn't want this field standardized. I, I wouldn't be so gray. I wouldn't have pimples on my face. This, this field, that's the problem with this field right there, is this has to be standardized. And I'm putting it on you guys that, that PCAST says it has to be standardized. Judge Kozinski says it has to be standardized. NRC has been saying it has to be standardized since 2009. Yes, it needs to be standardized. There is no protocol for every laboratory that is the same protocol. Everybody uses a different protocol. ASCLAD, the big, powerful, almighty ASCLAD, or is it Oz? ASCLAD, not Oz. ASCLAD, they come in and they accredit the laboratories. They accredit the laboratories for using their protocols and operating procedures correctly, not for using a standard, one standard protocol and procedure, but for that individual laboratory, what protocols they have developed. That's what ASCLAD come in, comes in and says, you're doing, you are following your own protocols. My God, how easy is that, right? If you wrote in your protocol, well, each analyst has to stand on their head during the extraction process. As long as you can prove to ASCLAD that Laura Sheely is actually standing on her head during the extraction process, I'm passing. There's a little bit more to it than that, but not a lot. So yes, we should be standardized. Uh, this is a 3130 sample sheet, the 3130 is the genetic analyzer that had the multiple uh, capillaries in it. Um, again, the analyst, the date, what capillaries are used, when the last time the capillaries were changed, um, when the last time the polymer was changed, what polymer was being used, because there's different polymers, and the polymer is the gel. Instead of the gelatin that we used to run DNA through, we just use a liquid gel, and the polymer has a different consistency. So it's important to look at what consistency the polymer is, look at the well that the sample's in, look at the sample number, make sure that's correct. Uh, we look at the, these are these all repeat themselves well in sample number. Now down here in the comment section of this form, it says that we're going to run it at the default 24 second injection time. That means that that, labor, that laboratory's default injection time is to run at 24 seconds. So they're going to run all these samples initially at 24 seconds because that's their default. Then you have the injection list. So you write down a list of every sample that you're going to inject. And from this list, you look at what instrument, there, what, what batch number it is, what instrument it is. And most of the scientists are geeks. And so uh, a lot of instruments are named Yoda and Darth Vader. At least a lot of my instruments are. <laughs> By the way, Happy Star Wars Day to everybody. Huh? Huh? May the fourth be with you. Uh, thanks for laughing. I heard a laugh. I appreciate that. You'll get an extra poker chip. Uh, 
the date, the run, the batch run, uh, the injection time. On this form, the injection time isn't filled out. Well, on the comment on the last form that we saw, they said that they were going to run it at default. This form actually says only fill it out if you're going to deviate from the default injection time, which is 24 seconds. So then you look at your samples, then you look at the notes. P U O K. That sounds like somebody passed gas. Um, P U O K. That means pull up. They, they notice pull up on this injection site, on, on this sample, but they determined that it was okay. They determined that the pull up was okay. Um, another note is OL at D7, D7 being a, a location, and it's OL. That means that it's off ladder, it's an off ladder allele. Yes. Pull up is when you, you see a and I can show it better when I have an electropharogram on the screen, but you know the peaks on the electropharogram? Does everybody know the peaks on the electropharogram? Pull up is when you have so much DNA in that sample that from another location, you're seeing extra pull up from that sample because you, you've overshot your target amount of 0.5 micrograms per, per microliter. Does that make sense? Yes. I want to go back to the that's, a, that's a, a word I like. I thought you guys would. Well, I made it up. Well, why, don't, why don't we just focus? The, the, the question is, if somebody can sit there and manipulate the science, and DNA is supposed to be the gold standard of forensic science, is it truly the gold standard of forensic science with manipulation going on? No, it's not. Uh, PCAST says it's not. It is because you don't need to manipulate. You, you know, the one discipline that they said was okay was, and I want you all to go home and if you read anything from me, please read the PCAST report. Um, the PCAST report says the only thing that is actually the gold standard are non-complex mixtures. Why that is, is because you don't need to manipulate non-complex mixtures. Complex mixtures, you're, you're having to read, you know, four or five people have contributed to this sample. So you're, you're having to guess, essentially, to who contributed this. And what, what most laboratories are doing, after the suspect's pro profile has been developed, or the victim's profile has been developed, then they compare it to the evidentiary sample. And the NRC1, the original NRC1 says, if we're gonna get into DNA, then the evidentiary sample gets developed alone by itself, then it gets called alone by itself, then you go and do the known samples. Prior to even, you, you make the profile, you pick what that profile is before you even know what the suspect's profile is or what, what the, the alleged victim's profile is. So you're not, you're not creating a cognitive bias, right? Can't you still do the manipulation of the suspect's profile? It's, well, because it's a signal source sample, you're not gonna get much for manipulating. How, when I say manipulate, there's only so much you can manipulate. You still can, and I'm gonna show you a case where it was done. Um, but, but in a single source sample, a known sample, you, you, you're still going to get the peaks where they're supposed to be. Because even if you crank it up for a 45 injection time, they're going to be off the chart, but they're still going to be at, the alleles are still going to be at those locations. So where it comes in is the complex mix samples, where the manipulation comes in. Is it going to change ultimately the profile itself, it could, but that's one of the reasons that another forensic scientist has to look at it. And to look at all this crap that I'm teaching you guys to at least know what it is, but so you get a forensic scientist or somebody to look at it for you and tell you. And I can certainly talk more about that, that a bit later, but, but that was an excellent question, thank you. So the question is, are we cutting corners 
what we would like is the entire genome mapped out. Right. We're not there given yet. The given the time and money and the research dedicated, it, it's still going to take us years to be able to do that. Obviously, scientists all over the world are working on mapping it out. But one thing that I will point out, and you've probably heard this before, the area of the DNA that we're looking at for forensics is, is a non-coding region. And we used to call it junk DNA, but with junk science being such a prevalent word, we're no longer calling it junk DNA. We called it that because it does not code for anything. It doesn't code for schizophrenia or blue eyes or red hair. It's non-coding. That's what makes it unique. All the coding locations we're all the same. It's our junk DNA, our non-useful DNA, that we're looking at as forensic scientists that, that makes us unique. At least that's where we are right now. Does, it, does that make? OK. So and then you look at the, what reference number it is. So let's go to some electropharograms. This is just a very simple electropharogram. You should have one of these in every case. This is a ladder. If they don't give you a ladder, there's a problem. You always want a ladder, a positive control, and a negative control to see what those controls and those ladders look like. A ladder is simply the company that produces the kits make a ladder so we know what the possible alleles are for any one location or one locus. We do this for every run to make sure that all of the alleles at all of the lo loci are coming up correctly. And if there's a deviant, it will be called OL like my other slide. It was an off ladder allele. That means that there is a peak that does not fall in the ladder range which means that it could be a problem. It, it might not be a problem. The scientists may not know that it's a problem. The question was, is what sort of thing should we be asking of a particular analyst to determine, uh, essentially, I'm just going to paraphrase, what they're doing, to find out what they're doing and how they've been doing it in the past, correct? Yeah. OK. So the answer to that is obviously what you want to discover their entire case folder. You want to discover the gene scan uh, data, colored electropharograms, all of their notes. Then you also want to discover communication. You want to discover every single one of these forms that I'm showing you, which should just be included in the case notes, the case file. Uh, but you want to discover deviation logs, you also want to discover proficiencies. Now, oftentimes they will just give you, yep, we passed a proficiency. But you want to discover, and I know you guys hate this. I know it. And I know that I have a couple of attorneys that I've worked with, Stacy, that I, I constantly ask this. I need to see their protocol. I want to know what their protocol says to do, because I can't challenge anything until I see what they're supposed to do in their protocol. It's not your expert trying to make you guys work hard, get subpoenas you don't want to get. It's us needing to look at what they're supposed to do to be able to identify what they have done wrong, if anything. There are some really great government labs out there that are doing a super job. And then there's a lot that aren't. Montana. <laughs> did, did I say that out loud? I'm sorry. Yes. What you would do is, is something to the effect that, that you want the case file to uh, included but not limited to the case notes, um, communication logs, hard colored copies of gene scan analysis, including colored electropharograms. Um, and I've got one for serology and I've got one for DNA. And I'm happy if you choose to pick up that really cool business card that I laid forth. 
uh, you contact me and I'll send you a discovery motion. And that's for anybody here. Maybe you'll have to buy me a drink or something. Um, so this is a negative. This is a negative control of an electropharogram. That looks just like it's supposed to look. There's no peaks at any position that would be a real low side. This is a positive control. Positive controls, I don't know why this happened, but a long time ago, when I first started, uh, why well, I was doing RFLP and then other, but when we finally got to PSR or PCR um, and, and identifier, what we started to do, because we'd just always done it in the past, is the kits that you get from the manufacturer, the, the two, two companies that make these kits, they provide a positive control to run. But many labs prefer to run a positive control of somebody in their laboratory. So they, they know what that is all the time. They know that if that's coming up, that that's a good positive control. And that just really hasn't changed since the RFLP days. So we just still usually run a positive control of somebody in the laboratory. Not me, because I don't want my DNA in any laboratory anymore. Um, what am I looking at immediately? When I look at these electropharograms, this is immediately what I look for. I look at the peak height. The peak height is the refraction fluorescent unit, and that's how we measure the peak height of, of these alleles. And if that peak height, this is a 13 allele, and the peak height is 424. I want to know that it's a good, strong peak height. I want to know that it's above 150. Again, with protocols, every lab has validated their own callable peak heights. Now laboratories have a callable peak height and a statistical peak height. They won't do statistics on some of them if they're below a certain threshold or a certain peak height level, but they'll, they'll go ahead and write it on the report that your suspect's included, but they won't give you a statistical value. Some labs won't even say your suspect's included or give you a statistical value. It all depends on the laboratory and the protocols. So I always look at the peak height to make sure that I'm getting a good peak height, that they haven't overblown the sample or underblown the sample. Next thing I look at is, are these two alleles at this location fairly balanced? This is a single source uh, positive control. I need to look and make sure if it's heterozygote, two alleles at one location, or homozygote, one allele at one location, if that, those, those peaks are balanced. So that's, that's immediately what I look at for the positive control. The negative control, I just make sure that there's no peaks there. And again, the XY, the amylogenin location, not really a, a low psi. It's not something that we do, you, we count towards statistics, but I want to make sure that that's balanced, that I'm getting an X and a Y that are pretty balanced and not maybe two female contributors and one male contributor. So you can tell, we actually can tell stuff from these peaks. Um, and then we have the summary sheet that tells us the suspect known and then compares it to the uh, evidentiary sample and the band-aid. In this case, and, and it looks like the suspect pretty much matches the evidentiary sample of the band-aid. 